Uh, good morning, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to the 2018 Australasian Aid Conference. And uh, before we do anything else, let us begin by acknowledging and celebrating the first Australians, the traditional owners on the land, of the land on which we're meeting. And let us pay our respects to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past and present. Uh, my name's Stephen Howes, and I'm the Director of the Development Policy Centre here at the ANU. And uh, on behalf of the Development Policy Centre I'd like, and, and the Crawford School, College of the Asia Pacific and the ANU, I'd like to welcome you all to this conference. Uh, I'll have more to say a little bit later, but we are pressed for time this morning. So I'm going to, without further ado, uh, ask you to join me to welcome uh, Vice-Chancellor, Professor Brian Schmidt. Thank you, Stephen, uh, and thank you for your acknowledgement uh, to country here uh, and to the elders of the Ngunnawal people, past, present, and emerging here on our campus. Uh, welcome, everyone, to ANU. It's great to see such a big crowd, and it was wonderful to see everyone walking down Liversidge due to the poor availability of pra uh, parking down at this end, but uh, showed, uh, uh, it showed just how big and uh, diverse this crowd is. Uh, this has become a prominent, this conference has become a prominent fixture on the ANU uh, calendar and it is great to see it just growing from strength to strength each year. Aid is an extraordinarily important part of diplomacy and one would argue perhaps the most effective way to spend one's defense budget. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and so one can do aid well or one can do it poorly. And of course, today we're all about doing aid well. And I look forward to uh, hearing the results of, of this conference. We are very uh, fortunate today to have Senator Penny Wong uh, to address us, uh, a very prominent figure in Australian politics, uh, a person who continually shows rationality in an era of of less than rational, uh, <laughs> rational thinking sometimes. And so it is great to uh, have her to address us today. As Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs, uh, Senator Wong will give us some insights on how the Labor Party plans to move forward with Australia's aid and development policy and its approach in engaging uh, in our region. Senator Wong has to rush back, so it's going to be a, uh, unfortunately, a fairly short uh, Q&A session. We'll see exactly how long she takes. Uh, but until then, I look forward to welcoming Senator Penny Wong. Uh, thanks very much for that. Um, uh, may I begin on this, the 10th anniversary of the apology to the stolen generation with a, with a particularly heartfelt welcome uh, acknowledgement of country. Uh, we stand on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri peoples and we pay our respects to elders past and present. Uh, to uh, Ryan, thank you for the introduction. I didn't realise I was taking Q&A because tactics has been held for me, but that's okay. <laughs> you know, we go with the flow. Uh, to Stephen, who's uh, I think one of the Australia's great contributors and intellects when it comes to development. Thank you for the opportunity to speak with you uh, all this morning, ANU and uh, the Asia Foundation. Uh, I really to be congratulated for your work in this area uh, and I hope that this conference continues that uh, forensic examination and creative thinking about development. So Shadow Foreign Minister, I've been seeking to lay out a framework for Labor's foreign policy that is one of purpose, energy and conviction that protects and advances our national interests and protect, protects, projects our identity and standing in the world. And of course, I agree with Brian that a central aspect of such a foreign policy is development assistance. Put simply, development assistance is central and will be central to the way in which Labor would realise its foreign policy. In refining our approach, I've had the invaluable assistance of Senator Claire Moore, uh, the shadow another shadow minister in my portfolio, and a range of Labor colleagues, Julian Hill, Madeleine King, Sharon Clayton, Lisa Singh, Tim Watts, Josh Wilson, Peter Kill, Khalil, Mike Freelander and Milton Dick. Uh, they've consulted uh, widely, uh, probably with some of, many of you, and I've drawn on their work in preparing not only this morning's presentation, but I intend to use it 
as some of the foundational material as we develop our policy in the lead up to the election. As public policy makers, we must ask ourselves, how do we maintain public support for development assistance and increase the public's confidence that the funding achieves its purpose? Purpose deals with the question why, and the why of foreign policy really is the same as the why of all public policy. The realisation of our national interests informed by our values, that is what we stand for. I outlined Labor's interests and values in presentations I delivered last year to the Lowy Institute and also to Griffith University. Our national interests are the security of the nation and its people, the economic prosperity of the nation and its people, a stable, cooperative, strategic system in our, system, in our region anchored in the rule of law and, of course, constructive internationalism. And our values, compassion, equity, inclusion, mutual respect and, mo and more, find expression in the rule of law that is the basis of our democratic practice, the contract between government and the people. So the answer to the question, why do we invest in development assistance, is because it is unquestionably in Australia's interests to create a more stable and secure world by helping reduce, reduce poverty, improve health and education and fight inequality. And how do we do this? We do this by building social and human capital. <laughs> That's a lovely ring. <laughs> For a democratic, caring and generous nation like Australia, international development assistance has long been a central element of our foreign policy consistent with our values and our national interests. We have a deep interest in and commitment to the maintenance of stability in our region and to reducing poverty where we can. And if the generosity that is a natural consequence of our respect for our shared humanity is not sufficient motivation, we should recognise too the economic and security consequences of instability and of poverty. These consequences are not only borne by the individual communities and nations affected, but in an in increasingly interconnected world they impact on us all. Failure to recognise this is profoundly short-sighted. Moreover, the decision by the Abbott and Turnbull governments to walk away from international development assistance funding, I would argue, undermines our national interests. So I can make this commitment today. A Labor government will rebuild Australia's international development assistance program and accordingly will increase investment beyond the current levels. Co the Coalition's attack on the development assistance budget has been tantamount to vandalism. It has not only impugned our reputation as an active and generous supporter of our neighbours in the region, but even more significantly, it has worked actively against our foreign policy interests. We, just give, we give just 22 cents in every $100 of our national income to development assistance. This is the lowest level since records were kept. Now, we have previously called on the Coalition to join us in a bipartisan commitment to rebuilding Australia's aid and development programs. We've sought this because we understand the human costs of the $11.3 billion in cuts. These are cuts that affect the li lives of people who can least afford it. We all understand that reduced international as development assistance leads to less development, poorer health outcomes, more poverty and, more and greater deprivation. In particular, we know that such cuts translate to more maternal deaths, fewer vaccinated children, fewer girls in schools, and greater numbers of vulnerable communities experiencing disproportionately the impacts of climate change. So with this in mind, I can say to you today, with confidence, a shortened Labor government will contribute more to international development assistance than the current government. And we will ensure more of it gets to the people who, is, who it is meant to be assisting. We will, to the fullest extent that financial circumstances allow, rebuild and grow the aid program in a timely manner, because our intention is that it once again reflects the generosity of the Australian people. So I again encourage the government to return to a properly bipartisan approach to international development assistance, because their current budgeted levels, which will see a relative decline, are really not defensible. As you know, poverty is the red column of the economic inequality ledger. A stream of studies continue to demonstrate <coughs> that at the national level, economic equality, inequality has grown across the globe. In its 2016 study, An Economy for the 1%, Oxfam showed that the richest 1% now own more than the rest of the world combined. In 2015, 62 individuals had the same wealth as 3.6 billion people. In the previous <coughs> decade and a half, the bottom half of humanity gained just 1% of the total increase in global wealth, while 50% went to the top 1%. So whilst development assistance will continue to be critical if structural inequality is to be addressed effectively, we do know 
that it alone doesn't fix the problem and it will need to be accommodated or continue to be accommodated between a broader framework of economic management that recognises and takes into account matters like trade liberalisation, lending and investment practices and international cooperation to address multinational tax avoidance. At the ACFID conference in November last year, I spoke about how global inequality and the poverty it generates cannot be addressed simply as a function of economic growth. In the current climate, it is even more apparent that for growth to have wide benefits, it must take into account distribution. The ANU's Development Policy Centre produces excellent work on development assistance, and its surveys suggest that whilst the Australian community is uncertain about the levels of funding and the results achieved, it continues to support development funding. Well, as you know, in this area, as in any public policy area, public support is critical. In our nearby region, demand for assistance far outstrips the capacity of donors, both government and NGO, to deliver. The flow of Rohingya refugees to Bangladesh imposes enormous demands on, on a country that is struggling to meet its own development goals. Refugee flows resulting from ongoing armed conflict in Syria and in Yemen continue to strain international agencies and aid donors. Many parts of Africa are in crisis as a result of civil war, consequent displacement of populations and drought. And the 65 million people who are currently displaced globally surpass the number of those displaced after World War II, during and after. Meeting demand has been made enormously more difficult as a result of the coalition's cuts. But even when we do, as a nation, return to historical levels of international development assistance, the need is greater than our ability to meet demand. It is for this reason, amongst others, we see the emergence of new, donor, uh, new development assistance donors and new approaches to financing. It is important that new donors and new approaches are sensitive to the on-ground needs of the recipients and that projects are carefully calibrated to the ability of recipients both to absorb and maintain the assistance provided. This is particularly important if assistance is provided in the form of soft loans. Such loans must reflect the recipient's ability to service them. The need, for our neighbours, the need of our neighbours for assistance and advice on the provisions of all forms of development assistance didn't wane when the Australian Government aband uh, abandoned the development assistance priorities laid down by successive governments since the 1970s. If anything, the nature and pace of economic and social developments and challenges in our region accelerated just as at the time as the coalition governments pulled back. So it's unsurprising that our neighbours seek assistance from other countries and other institutions. Countries will do so. Seek assistance and support for their development priorities wherever they can, and donors will respond to such requests as they see fit, because there is far greater unmet demand and scope for all forms of development assistance <coughs> than can ever be met by a single country or institution, no matter how large. What has become clear is the need for greater efforts to coordinate the design and delivery of development assistance programs across our region, both to protect against duplication and to ensure that the programs delivered and their associated financing packages meet the needs of recipients. Greater dovetailing of assistance activities will certainly generate greater efficiencies at a time when funding levels are under pressure. So how would Australia's development assistance program operate in this environment? Well, first of all, Labor accepts that the UN-mandated Sustainable Development Goals provide a guide to development assistance outcomes. They offer a framework for implementing the grand bargain struck by major aid organisations and donors at their meeting in Istanbul in 2016. The grand bargain recognised that the status quo is no longer an option. We need to find and create efficiency, which in turn demands innovation, collaboration and changed mindsets. And central to change mindsets is a focus on social and human capital, because when they increase, poverty reduces. <coughs> Secondly, Labor will work to ensure that development and delivery mechanisms are streamlined. At the ACFID conference last November, I put on record Labor's disagreement with the decision to terminate AusAid and move its functions into DFAT. It was a, a deeply counterintuitive decision, but I also said that the egg can't be unscrambled and that we'll have to do what we can to ensure that it works. Senator Moore and the aid team of backbenchers uh, that I've outlined has consulted, ha has consulted widely with the international development assistance sector. And I would say this to you, the sector expressed to us 
a great many problems. They identified problems, structural inadequacies, management failings, DFAT's growing dependence on managing contractors as its own expertise and skills have declined. One stakeholder commented, you can't outsource your brain, that's what DFAT tries to do. <laughs> I report that without comment. <laughs> okay. We have listened carefully to the sector's comments and ideas and in, uh, in government we would ask the, the department to address them. This will also entail ongoing consultation with recipients. We do need to ensure that DFAT is fit for purpose in its capability and management of its international development assistance responsibilities and I'm sure that the department's leadership would agree. Thirdly, we need to recognise that the various <coughs> outcomes identified by the SDGs are interlinked. And, that's what happens in one and that what happens in one target area may affect other target areas in quite profound ways. To illustrate that, I want to look briefly at four particular streams of development assistance, and they are climate change, health, gender and education. In the November 2017 Conference of the Parties in Bonn, Fiji and the World Bank released their climate vulnerability assessment, which highlighted the fact that climate change presents poverty reduction with even more formidable odds. The assessment acknowledges that Fiji is already exposed to large natural risks, but that climate change is likely to amplify these risks. This threatens the objectives of Fiji's National Development Plan. The vulnerability assessment predicted that by 2050, in excess of 30,000 Fijians will be pushed into poverty every year as a result of floods and tropical cyclones. But of course, Fiji is not the only country in this position. If you look at the World Bank OECD report, Climate and Disaster Resilience Financing from February 2017, you see the following facts. Vanuatu, which receives $69.8 million in ODA from Australia, loses over 50 million or 6.6% .6 of annual GDP due to natural disasters. Tonga suffers a 4.4% loss of annual GDP, some $17 million. And both Fiji and the Solomon Islands incur losses above 2.6% and nearly 3% of GDP respectively as a result of natural disasters, amounting to over $150 million each year. So if our development assistance program is seeking to grow the social and human capital that enables people to be lifted or lift themselves out of poverty whilst the consequences of climate change continue to under undermine that outcome, then clearly disaster risk reduction must become a more prominent, prominent feature of our development assistance planning. The fact is climate change impacts every aspect of our aid program, such that we cannot be serious about tackling poverty in our region if we are not serious about tackling climate change. The 2014 report that the WHO released forecast in that climate change will cause an additional 250,000 deaths per annum between 2030 and 2050. 38,000 from heat exposure, 60,000 from malaria, 48,000 from diarrhoea and 95,000 from malnutrition. Yet the regional effects of climate change have largely been ignored by the coalition, although I do note uh, Ms Bishop has sought quietly to maintain some programs. Yet they constitute an existential threat to many states and we need to invest in building the national resilience, the capaci their capacity to deal uh, with the challenge that climate change represents because of course what happens in the Pacific affects us. If we want a stable and prosperous region, we have to confront its realities. And the cynicism of Peter Dutton's remarks, time doesn't mean anything when you're about to have water lapping at your door, reminds us just how far this government needs to travel if it is to understand this basic fact. Health is an area in which Australia can make a real difference. Yet here again, with support has been withdrawn. Development assistance investment, in health sits at just over 13% of our current aid program. When Labor was last in government, health accounted for 17% within a significantly larger funding pool. There have, however, been some indications from the Foreign Minister that Australia's development assistance program is beginning to take health more seriously, and I welcome that. In recent weeks, we've seen the Minister accept a position on the End Malaria Council, and the long-awaited health security initiative for the Indo-Pacific region is developing. But there are, that like the questionable innovation exchange, this initi initiative does look at the moment somewhat bureaucratic and disconnected from the research centres and delivery systems that already exist in Australia. I do want to say that I am convinced by the need for greater innovation in our international development program. I am, however, unconvinced that the innovation exchange model is the right one. 
Leaving aside the unfortunate emphasis on celebrity and an apparent fascination with bean bags, <laughs> I do question whether it adds a sufficiently ambitious degree of innovation to our aid program. There seems to be some view that innovation comprises a series of light bulb moments, rather than recognising the merit of creative and dynamic partnerships that bring a wide range of perspectives to problem solving. Certainly the feedback from many outstanding research bodies here in Australia would suggest there is much more to offer from collaboration than we are currently attaining. The Innovation Exchange also operates in what appears to be relative isolation, not only in its location, but in its impact on the aid program. So we do want, to, we do want if elected, to make a much more considered approach as to how innovation can be integrated across our aid program. The Australian health research community's expertise lends itself well to the Indo-Pacific Health Security Initiative. We can hope that with the awarding of both the health policy research proposals and the product development partnership funding programs later this year, our aid program will improve as a result of the Australian scientific community's engagement. Because health, along with education, is of course a fundamental contributor uh, to development. Chronic but preventable ill health is a showstopper with respect to economic participation and without economic participation, individuals and communities are consigned to continued poverty. And you, as I wrote on the development policy blog late last year, poor health outcomes self-evidently hinder economic development. For example, one of the biggest challenges facing our region is child stunting due to poor and unhygienic nutrition. I wonder how many Australians know that 60% of children in Timor-Leste, 44% of children in P PNG, a third of the children in Kiribati and 26% of the children in Vanuatu are stunted. All preventable. And despite many countries and regions improving nutrition levels as they meet the MDGs, we have seen no substantial improvement in the Pacific since the 1990s. The Pacific and Timor-Leste have incredibly young populations and without health interventions at an early age, the potential quality of life for individuals and the future economic re development of the region will be severely diminished before many of these children have even started school. Addressing the health needs of children in the region has a strong return on investment and, of course, intervention in children's health, health reduces a future cost on a recipient country's health infrastructure. According to Save the Children, specific nutrition interventions can deliver a return on investment of $16 to $1, double the return of aid for trade investments. Yet according to the 2015 Office for Development Effectiveness report into child undernutrition, nutrition programs account for only 2.4% of, accounted for only 2.4% of the spend in the previous financial year. So within the aid budget, we need to sharpen our focus on child health particularly in the Pacific, where immunisation coverage remains lower than other areas of the Indo-Pacific. The low availability and use of the Hib vaccine is of real concern, and in Southeast Asia, there is 80% coverage compared with 28% in the West Pacific region. So we need to do more to engage with governments and multilateral funds such as Gavi to improve the health outcomes of our children in the region, of children in our region. When I spoke at ACFID, I also said Labor would seek to build on the work that the current government has done in bringing gender to the forefront of our aid program. Of course, the focus on the, on, on the empowerment of women must also address structural factors, factors because it is structural effect, factors which allow discrimination that causes gender inequality. And if we don't address them, we find, we find ourselves finding ourselves in the scenario we've had in PNG during the recent election, where despite having a record number of female candidates, many of whom were supported by Australia's aid program, and I support that, we saw no women elected. Achieving change takes time, and our funding cycles also need to reflect this. And there are also continuing health challenges facing women. Labor and government will seek to build on the current government efforts to achieve 80% of programming targeted at pr improving the equality of women and girls. We know that the maternal death rate in Pacific and Timor-Leste remains unacceptably high and they can be reduced, that can be reduced to properly funded sexual health and family planning programs. This is an area of programming which has experienced turbulent changes as a result of the global gag rule, which Murray Stopes International claims has resulted in the deaths of nearly 7,000 women and girls due to entirely avoidable maternal health complications. 
we must also not forget that upon coming to government, the Australia's Family Planning Program was cut by 40% by the Coalition. I do note uh, and support last year's pledge by the Ambassador for Women and Girls for an additional funding of $33.5 million over four years. Cervical cancer rates in the Pacific are amongst the highest in the world. Women in the Pacific are dying at the rate of uh, up to nine times that of Australia due to the fact that screening is not available. In the Pacific, uh, the incidence of cervical cancer rests between 13.3% to 13.3 and 37.8 per 100,000. And sadly for these women, the diagnosis of cancer obviously comes, o often comes too late. Given our le leadership in HPV development and subsidised public immunisation, there's genuine hope that the virus can be eradicated. We can and should try to have a much bigger impact. Behides, besides health, education is another pillar on which social and human capital are built. At present, we dedicate $675 million of our ODA funding to education. This does compare unfavourably with the Labor government's investment in education in 2012 when 21% of, again, a much bigger development assistance budget was earmarked for education. In an ODA assistance budget totalling $5.2 billion, education attracted o over a billion dollars. In a report published in May last year, UNESCO demonstrated that globally, development assistance in education plateaued in 2010 and has been stagnating ever since. This is due in part to the reallocation of development assistance funds to refugee assistance permissible under the aid rules, and in part also to the decline of aid funding in the aftermath of the GFC. Under this government, we have seen a continued decline in education funding, including the reduction of its already low contribution to the Global Partnership for Education by a further $50 million. But if developing countries are to develop the social and human capital necessary to develop, Education must be a principal target because together with health, education, particularly education for women and girls, is just so important. And I say to you today, it will be a hallmark of our approach to development assistance policy in government. The Coalition's unprecedented cuts to development assistance over the last four years have caused great harm. And they've caused har great harm to some of the poorest people in our region. They've also impugned our reputation internationally and I would argue have undermined our national interests. They've harmed our efforts to alleviate poverty and to make our region safer and more secure and they have diminished our standing in the region. <coughs> and they also, I firmly believe, are at odds with the generous spirit of the Australian people. That is why Labor considers we must and can do better. So I have pledged to you today that Labor and Government will rebuild our International Development Assistance Program and increase investment beyond current levels. But to be frank with you, what I would much prefer is to take all the politics out of aid and have the Government join, join with us in a bipartisan commitment to rebuilding Australia's aid and development programs. And I fervently hope that we can once more commit, as we both did during the 2013 election, <coughs> to a shared and non-partisan goal to improve Australia's record on development assistance for the sake of all those who live in poverty and, uh, and especially those children whose lives are stunted by poverty, poor health or lack of education. Thank you very much. Thank you, Senator Wong. I think the audience is going to take great heart at your uh, comprehensive uh, analysis of uh, development aid, and uh, certainly this group is uh, clearly keen to help uh, with that based on evidence and experience, and I think uh, you bringing uh, lots of evidence and, and strong ideas uh, to the fore, great. Now, uh, I did highlight that uh, we probably wouldn't be able to have Q&A because you need to leave at 828 yes. and it's 828. But if you want to take one I'll or take two, one, okay, one. great. Over to you. Hands up if you want to ask uh, Senator Warren a question. Um, Sarah, yes. Can you just please know our broken mic isn't working. Just yell. Yeah, please, in the red. Uh, well, I thought I did seek to address 
You mean the domestic program or on internationally? No, yeah, yes. Well, I mean, I, I thought I referenced that. We, we'd seek to build on uh, the programs that deal with um, women's inequality. The, the, the policy point I was seeking to make, though, was, uh, I suppose it's the difference between a liberal feminist and social democratic feminist. I actually think, <laughs> I actually think there are structural factors which you have to address as well. And, and um, that there is, it's not without purpose, without, without merit, but I think addressing the empowerment of women in the abstract and, and failing to recognise sufficiently in how, you, in how you design your programs that there are structural inequalities which bear upon gender equality is problematic. That was the point I was seeking to make. I clearly didn't make it very clearly. <laughs> Now you got you get you get a real usually in an audience I have three men in a row is my rule and then I say the next question has come from women we've had two of them. this is a, this is oh no it's not about you Brian <laughs> actually it's about them I'm, I'm giving them a compliment Mar Marie Nutt from Results Australia uh, Senator Wong thanks very much for your comments this morning particularly the last ones about taking politics out of aid and yep. having a bi bipartisan approach. So taking a slight tangent, I wondered if you were concerned about the threats to civil society voice around this and bringing the public into, into the conversation about aid with the proposed charity legislation that's, that's with the government at the moment. Well, uh, when I was finance minister, we had a policy, and in fact, I think I put it in legislation, but it was overridden, that we couldn't include gag or gag clauses in um, government funding arrangements, which I think this government has, has moved beyond. Uh, if you're talking about the foreign interference laws, yes, I mean, I'm on that committee, so the intelligence committee, so I, I try not to make too many public comments about it, but I would say that uh, the evidence given by the sector in public hearing demonstrated some real problems in the way the legislation has been drafted, and I welcome uh, Mr Porter, the, the new Attorney General's, uh, delaying the uh, uh, the passage of that legislation or the consideration of that legislation through the parliament because I think that is one of a number of factors that need to be addressed. What I would say is this though more broadly on the issue of civil society and development assistance. We don't live in, um, you know, we live in what I've described and others have described as disrupted times and one aspect of that disruption uh, globally and here in Australia has been the rise of populism and nationalism and that's well documented. We could have a long discussion about that. How that translates into the aid discussion here in Australia is you have voices uh, inside the parliament uh, who are strongly advocating against any development assistance uh, and uh, consequently and um, concomitantly you have voices inside the coalition who are advocating against any development assistance. Now I, I place on record that you know whilst Ms Bishop hasn't been able to defend the budget uh, from all cuts and you know she has said and done as much as uh, she, she has been able. Uh, if we are going to rebuild our development assistance budget which I think is actually in our national interest and it will take a long time. Stephen Howes did a, I think an article last year which actually calculated some of the effect in the forward estimates. Uh, that will require support from both parties of government ultimately, at least from some people within it. And the problem we have at the moment is too much of that populism and we shouldn't be sending any money offshore line from Ms Hansen and others gets too much traction and that's a job for all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Penny Wong, on behalf of the ANU and our co-sponsor, the Asia Foundation. Uh, quite different, in a quite different category, it's our co-host. And it has been since our first conference, and this is now the fifth. And we really, really value that partnership with the Asia Foundation, and it enables us to bring out a whole uh, range of speakers and cover a range of topics we wouldn't Please come and say a few words. Please welcome Gordon Hyde. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome to all of you. On, on behalf of the Asia Foundation, uh, let me express our, our thanks to Vice Chancellor Schmidt and to Stephen Howes of the Development Policy Center and to say how pleased we are to again be joining with them in this important event. 
As Stephen noted, this marks the fifth time the Australasian Aid Conference has been held here at the ANU, and it's been our honor to be part of it uh, since the beginning. In a relatively short time, this annual conference has evolved and grown tremendously in size and scope. Can't even begin to accommodate all the people who would like to be here, which is a real testament to, to Stephen's leadership and the Development Policy Center's success in, in organizing the conference. Growing number of participants from throughout the region and the, around the world, and it's established itself as an important venue for serious discussion of national, regional, and global issues in international development and development cooperation. In the same way, the, the research, the publications, the regular blogs coming out produced by the Development Policy, Policy Center have become, I think for all of us, must-reads for people interested in the current state and emerging trends in international development. For those of you who may not be so familiar with the Asia Foundation, let me say just very briefly, we are a, a nonprofit non-government international development and foreign affairs organization founded in 1954. Uh, we have our headquarters in San Francisco, where I am based. But what's most important is that we operate through a network of 18 uh, permanent country offices uh, throughout Asia, many of which have been in place since the 1950s, and each of which is deeply embedded in the local societies in which we work. Working with uh, local partners in government, civil society, private sector and the academic and research community, we support and implement programs in five main areas, governance and law, women's empowerment and gender equality, economic development, the environment, and international relations. We also have a robust uh, research and survey agenda, and in December we signed uh, an MOU with the ANU, with the uh, Australia Survey Archive, to be the repository and distributor of our extensive uh, collection of perception surveys. Going back to 2004, our work has benefited greatly from the support, cooperation, and partnership with the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. And I want to publicly express our gratitude to DFAT for that strong and close relationship. For the past eight years, as Asian countries have emerged as major providers of international development assistance, We've been implementing a program focused on emerging Asian donors, uh, seeking to better understand and to add value to the global conversation about how Asian providers are changing the aid landscape and how these changes can support and foster more effective development, especially in the Asia Pacific. Uh, through this program, we've been able to contribute Asian perspectives to the global development uh, discourse, as well as support capacity development for Asian providers and encourage more effective South-South cooperation. And as part of this effort, every year we organize panels at this conference showcasing the perspectives of development experts and practitioners from different Asian countries. Uh, and this year we'll have a plenary session uh, focused on the growing role of Asian civil society actors uh, in Asian-led development cooperation. Uh, in closing, let me just uh, say again how pleased we are to be uh, uh, collaborating with Stephen House and the Development Policy Center in this uh, important conference. We look forward to continuing and expanding this cooperation uh, going forward. We've got an incredibly rich agenda in front of us. I think we're all suffering from this dilemma of which panels to go to because we'd like to go to all of them. Uh, I know we're all going to learn a lot over the next two days and I know I'm certainly looking forward to it. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Gordon. Uh, so we, it's a huge conference, and uh, we're fortunate here to have a great team uh, organizing it. Uh, we'll thank them all at the end, uh, but I'd now like to call on Ashley Betteridge, our center manager, to go over some of the logistics of the conference. Ashley. Thanks, Stephen. After many months of getting ready for the conference, it's always fantastic to see everyone arrive, particularly our speakers. I'm always relieved when I see them get off the plane. <laughs> so it's great to be here this morning, and I hope everyone has a fantastic time at the conference. Um, I just need to run through a few housekeeping and logistic things, just so we can enjoy the amazing program over the next few days. So bear with me, I'll be quick. 
Um, in case you hadn't noticed, this conference is huge. <laughs> um, for those of you who didn't get a chance to get your lanyards this morning, please do go and get them at morning tea. Um, there are 150 people downstairs, as well as about 220 in this theatre, so there's a lot of us here um, over the next two days. So just keeping that in mind, for those who are on shared registrations, I just ask you to please follow those rules of the shared registration with um, one person present per shared registration at any one time. Um, it's, as Stephen's mentioned, it's first in best dress for the plenaries in this theatre, so congratulations. <laughs> um, sorry to Western and Acton theatre goers. Um, so do arrive early if you do want to get a seat in the room, and we'll keep advocating for like a mezzanine floor in here for next year. Um, so the main sessions are also being live streamed into Western and onto the web. And if you're having trouble choosing which sessions to attend, um, we do have details in the program, but the full abstract book is also available online on our website. Uh, the dinner this evening has sold out. It sold out very early. So um, you do need to be registered to attend. Um, if you can't remember if you included dinner in your registration, it should say in the emails you got from Eventbrite. Otherwise, you can check with one of our team downstairs at the registration desk. Um, for those who didn't make it to Nick Danziger's talk last night, it was fantastic, um, and thanks for everyone who turned out. Um, you've still got time to go and see his amazing exhibition revisited at Drill Hall Gallery. It's going to be open between 12 and 2 every day of the conference, and then from next week it will be open longer days if, you, if you're a Canberran. So do definitely get along and see that. He goes back to the same places in 2005, 2010 and 2015 and looks at the impact of development, some positive stories and unfortunately some very sad ones, but it's definitely worth seeing. Um, so, throughout the conference, because I've got to talk about food, that's always an important thing on the feedback forms. <laughs> Morning, afternoon tea and lunch and tea and coffee will be served downstairs outside the Barton Theatre. And if you've let us know about any special dietary requirements, just let the catering staff know and they'll um, get you either a special meal or tell you what you can and can't have. Um, so because the conference is so huge with so many concurrent sessions um, and very busy and full days, we do really need to keep on time. So for those chairing sessions, we need your help in making sure we stick to time. Each session will have an event assistant or a volunteer assigned to look after it and help out, and they will identify themselves to you prior to the start of the session. So do let them know how they can assist you in timekeeping for the sessions. We have cards to help people know when there's five minutes, one minute and stop. <laughs> um, so definitely let those helpers know so that they can help you keep the session on time. And presenters, please do stick to your time so that everyone gets a fair go. Plus every year in the feedback survey, everyone wants more Q&A. So um, <laughs> everyone needs to stick to time if we're gonna achieve that goal. <laughs> Um, and as I mentioned, we're live streaming from Malongolo, so if you're talking in this room, you need to use a microphone just so that people at home and downstairs can hear. While we're talking tech, though, tomorrow is our popular three-minute three minute aid pitch session back for the second year, um, and that involves interactive audience voting. So do bring along your smartphone or tablet or laptop to the session so that you can vote for your favourite pitch, and we'll be handing out instructions in the session tomorrow. And since you all have your devices, you can see our hashtag up here. There's already a bit of activity on the hashtag after Senator Wong's speech, so do get involved. Um, I'd also just like to invite everyone to engage with our wonderful sponsors for this year's conference who have exhibition stands just outside here in the Malongolo Theatre. We're really grateful for their support, as Stephen mentioned. Um, and we hope to see you tomorrow evening at the closing reception for the conference, which is also serving as the opening session for the DFAT Aid Suppliers Conference, which starts on Thursday. And it will be a great way to close what I know will be a fabulous few days. If you have any questions, our team at the registration desk will do our best to help. And we'd also love it if you could complete the conference feedback survey because we're always trying to do better each year. And that's all I have to say. I got through it on time, I think. <laughs> um, so yeah, the only thing left is to say thank you for coming and have a fantastic conference. All right, thank you, Ashley. And yeah, if I don't get another chance, thank you to Ashley and the uh, team that have worked so hard to put this conference <coughs> on and, and bring it all together. Uh, now I'd uh, like to call on Blair Excel. Blair is now the Acting Deputy Secretary uh, for Development within the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, taking over from Ewan McDonald. 
And I'm sure many of you know Blair. Uh, he is, has been the um, I think Assistant Secretary of Development Policy within DFAT, and before that served in a variety of senior roles in AusAid, uh, heading up uh, Solomon Islands and uh, Indonesia, among other positions. And uh, yeah, we really appreciate the partnership you know, we have with DFAT in different ways, and uh, I think it's very appropriate uh, that Blair uh, has, has agreed to chair uh, the uh, Nancy Birdsell keynote speech. So please welcome Blair Excel. Thank you, Stephen, for those kind words. Um, it's my pleasure also to welcome you all here today. So I've certainly been to all five in, in the last fi five years, different, different guises and different roles, but it's a real privilege to actually be so close and be able to duck down and participate like many other colleagues from DFAT do. So we really also appreciate it. Um, let me join colleagues and also um, begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land in which we meet today and pay my respects to their elders past and present. Um, it is my absolute privilege though for my key role here this morning to introduce um, our keynote speaker from the Centre of Global Development, Dr Nancy Birdsell. Um, for those that don't know, as I said yesterday, but should, um, the CGD is one of the leading global and highly influential think tanks that really thinks hard about development based in Washington DC. It's known for independent research that leads to practical creative solutions to some of the most pressing problems that the world faces today. Dr Nancy Birdsell is a senior fellow and president emeritus at the Centre for Global Development before launching the centre, which I think is enough in itself before I go on to read the, less, the, the rest of the accomplishments, before launching the centre in 2001. Uh, Nancy served for three years as a Senior Associate and Director of Economic Reform Project at the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. From 93 to 98, she was Executive Vice President of the Inter-American Development Bank. Before joining the Inter-American Inter -American Development Bank, she spent 14 years in research policy and other management positions at the World Bank. Dr. Birtzel is the author and co-author and editor of more than a dozen books um, and monographs on international development issues, author of over 75 articles on, on uh, development, um, with my favourite title being The Development Agenda as a Global Social Contract or We're All in the Development Boat Together. Um, apart from Dev Policy and the Asia Foundation, CGD is my go-to website um, and certainly my go-to podcast when I'm travelling for when I know what's happening, so there's a personal plug plug there. Turn, turning to today's talk, the SDGs commit the world to eradicate extreme poverty and reduce inequality within and between countries. One way that we can contribute to both those goals is to focus on people who live just above the poverty line, but through the experience of shocks are likely to fall back into poverty. There are many people, many of these people living in middle income countries, including in our neighbourhood. In DFAT, we spend quite a lot of time thinking about our region and countries moving through the income um, uh, levels. Uh, it's something that we think about a lot. Um, in my time in Indonesia, as Stephen said, in fact, I recall Stephen making a visit when he was the chief economist for AusAid, and we spent quite a bit of time debating this issue. With Indonesia in itself, a very good example of the large number of people living just above the poverty line that can move in and out. So as people concerned about development and poverty reduction, we need to actively work to reduce the vulnerability of this group. So today, uh, Nancy will address the issue of the large number of people living, often, in, as I said, in middle-income countries, how best to move them up the income scale, and in doing so, reduce their vulnerability to falling back into poverty. So without further ado, let me welcome Nancy to the stage, and I think we will take questions and answers at the end. Thank you. <clears throat> well, thank you very much, Blair. Uh, my goodness, uh, it's really a privilege to be here in Australia. I was thinking when your shadow minister was talking that this is the land, I'm coming from the tumult in Washington and Australia seems to me very much a land of civility and calm. <laughs> uh, I want to thank uh, Stephen House particularly and his colleagues Ashley and others uh, at the uh, Development Policy Institute. And of course, it's a great pleasure to realize that this conference is co-hosted by the Asia Foundation, a group I've long admired uh, since I first came into acquaintance with the work of Asia Foundation in Vietnam a long time ago and saw how well embedded it is in each country and how important that is. 
Um, the last thing I want to say is I found very civilizing and bespeaks something about values in Australia, this allusion <coughs> to the uh, traditional custodians of the land. So it's really a great pleasure to be here. Um, I want to say one word about CGD's work, the Center for Global Development, which I think <coughs> is interesting and important, even though it is not particularly the focus of what I'm going to talk about today. But <coughs> CGD's mission is, as is the case for so many of you here, to reduce poverty and inequality in the world. <coughs> the focus of our work, however, has been primarily on what the rich world can do to improve the lives of people in the developing world. And so we look at not only aid, but at migration issues, trade, uh, climate, the climate challenge, technology transfer, the whole range of decisions and policies and behavior in a rich part of the world, including obviously Australia, that have good or bad effects. And so our policy push has very much been to, uh, for example, <coughs> try to tell DFOT how to do better, <laughs> in a way. So I wonder if Ashley, or S Ashley's probably gone to worry about other things, but I'd like to have a signal at 30 minutes. Great, so there's plenty of time for Q&A, and I do sometimes tend to talk too much. <coughs> so my topic is strugglers. Uh, this century's new development <laughs> challenge. And the idea of this talk is to try to bring you along to a somewhat different lens on the development challenges in this century compared to the 20th century, when we can look back and say there's been a tremendous amount of success. And it's symbolized most commonly by the reality that uh, billions of people were lifted out of poverty. But I want to talk about, uh, <coughs> I want to start with this gentleman. Um, I don't know how many of you remember the name Mohammed Bouazizi. <coughs> in uh, 2010, it's already seven years ago, in December of 2010, uh, Mohammed Bouazizi is the gentleman who immolated himself uh, in a town south of, um, in southern Tunisia, and triggered, he was kind of the spark, his immolation, self-immolation triggered the Arab Spring when there was a wave of hope for a change, a big changes in the direction of democracy uh, and more integration and <coughs> all of the good things about good government in the Arab world. So when he immolated himself, I looked, uh, tried to understand where he stood in the world in terms of a simple measure, I'm an economist, his income, his likely income. And what I discovered is that he was definitely not a poor man. Uh, he, thank you very much, <coughs> he was not poor. Indeed, in the newspaper reports, it was told that he gave away he had a vegetable cart, which he brought into the center of town and sold his produce there. And at the end of the day and sometimes the end of the week, he gave what hadn't been sold to the poor. On the other hand, why did he immolate himself? It's because, in effect, he was being harassed by the police. He obviously <coughs> lived in what he must have felt, and many of his ilk must have felt, was a kind of rigged society, um, a corrupt society. The police were bugging him either to pay for a license more often than he might, or just extorting money from him for the right to be in the village center selling vegetables from his cart. And what happened one day, the day he immolated himself, is that they took away his cart, they got irritated and angry. Um, <coughs> they took away his cart and the scale that he used to measure the weights of his produce. Um, and 
he obviously had come to a point of great frustration and anger uh, about the way society was working. So it didn't work out, the Arab Spring, um, but I think we should still, in, indeed maybe that's why we should think back to the plight of people who are not under the World Bank poverty line of $1.90 a day, but are clearly far from anything you or I sitting here in Canberra would think of as a relatively secure middle class. So I'm asking you to, you know, and many of you will know much of what I'm saying, but uh, I want you to sort of think of what I call this group, the strugglers or the strivers. Uh, why do they matter? How do they matter? So the idea of the talk is to first explain the struggler classification in crude economic terms, as you'll see, based on uh, numbers between $4 a day and $10 a day. <clears throat> then to talk a little bit about the characteristics of the people in the world who are in this crude category between $4 and $10 a day of household income per capita. Then to talk about why they matter and including, you know, I hope to hear from you <laughs> because you know your region far better than I do. You heard I was at the Inter-American Development Bank. I know a lot more about Latin America and I've done much more in Africa than in um, Southeast Asia. Africa, India, but not so much Southeast Asia. And then to go on to what to th how to think about how should a, a sort of recognition of this group change the way we think in the development field and change a little bit what we think is important to do. So a little uh, with a focus on the role of outsiders. <coughs> and going back to, excuse me, the C CGD mission of what can outsiders do to supplement and help the uh, movements inside countries for uh, development, for improve lives for more people. So let me start with this picture. That shows you, you don't really have to figure it out, I'll explain it. But it's meant to convince you that there's something to this. Uh, this is a picture based on uh, data collected in a panel, a set of panel surveys in three countries of Latin America over five years or so, three to five years. And what it's telling you is uh, if you live between $4 a day and $10 a day, between the two vertical lines, in those countries, uh, you have a relatively high probability of returning below what the country poverty lines are, which is around $4 a day. So in the case of uh, living, people living at $6 a day per capita, which is probably where Mohammed Bouazizi's family was. Um, he had a large family. He was the sole breadwinner. He was the big brother. He was putting his sister, uh, hoping to get her through secondary school, maybe even get her to the university. So maybe 5 or $6 a day household income uh, in, in that family. Uh, if you have $6 a day, uh, you have more than a 40% chance of falling back into poverty over a period of three years. If you get up to $10 a day, your probability declines to about 10%. So with other economists, particularly working on Latin America, there's been a kind of sense that $10 a day is a reasonable line for joining the middle class. Uh, it's reasonable in the sense of that's when you become materially secure. You will not be necessarily secure if there's a long economy-wide recession or depression. And so we know that the middle class in some countries of the West, say in the 1930s in Germany, was hit very hard. Uh, and, was and there's a lot of discussion in the U.S. now about the hollowing out of the middle class because median wages have not have been stagnant for so long. 
But I'm not talking about those big shocks. I'm talking about household shocks. You know, as in the case of Bouazizi, it was a shock. His assets, his productive assets, were destroyed. So, and he had borrowed the day before to buy the vegetables that he was selling. So he was he in debt, in effect. <coughs> That's a household shock, or a child gets sick and so on. So the strugglers can be defined as those who are vulnerable to falling back into poverty. And many of you know who study development that there's a lot of churning around the poverty line. This is telling you, you know, of say $2 a day that people go back and forth. There's been evidence of that now for some decades. But this, what this is telling us is that it's the churning can occur at higher levels of income. And that in effect, from some sort of emotional or psychological point of view, your life does not change at $1.91 a day. It only begins to change when you get up closer to something like $10 a day. So this is a picture, uh, again, it's a little bit confusing. You don't really need to figure it out. Some of you will know that recently the World Bank decided to add poverty lines that are higher than $1.90 a day for, uh, and they're set at uh, $3.20 for lower middle income countries and $5.50 for upper middle income countries. So that's very interesting. It's recognizing that poverty is relative and I think it helps underline the point that people in some income category well above $1.90 a day are still, uh, can still be very poor if you think of poverty in a multidimensional sense in terms of the multi many deprivations and the pressures and the stress and the anxieties that are associated with can I feed my family if not day to day, certainly week to week. So that, I sh I'm just showing you this to reemphasize <coughs> the idea that the strugglers are the new poor and should be thought of in the development community as the new poor of this century. <coughs> so we cannot, we can celebrate the reduction in extreme poverty that's occurred over the last 20, 25 years. But at the same time, we have to see as a big challenge what to do about the struggler group. Now, how big is this group? It's really huge. Uh, in this graph, the red is the poor and orange are the strugglers, okay? So in 90, which is the top line, you can see that in the developing world, most people were really amongst the extreme poor. But if you go down to 2030, you see that in the developing world, reasonable projections based on growth, you know, projections for countries aggregated suggests that strugglers will still constitute 60% of the population of the developing world. It's about the same as now. It's still 60%. Some people will be moving into the middle class. You know, this is very mechanical in a way uh, with growth. By the way, the underlying projections assume no changes within countries in the distribution of income. So it's just imposing mechanically growth that's hoped for in the next 10 or 15 years on uh, applying it across the board using whatever distribution now of the benefits of growth prevails in any particular country. So this is picture is just another way of saying in the last 25 years, uh, things have changed dramatically in the way we should envision in our heads what is going on in the developing world and what, is li what life is like for most people. Um, you also see in the green the growth of the middle class, and I'm going to, co going to come back to that in a few minutes. But let me say, you know, just another factoid. 80% of the developing country population uh, lives under $10 a day today. And ask yourself, what percent 
of the rich world population lives under $10 a day. And think of a number, and it's estimated to be 2.5%. These are really different worlds. So this is just a quick picture of uh, what's behind those projections showing a doubling uh, of the middle class, <coughs> which is the green line in the last uh, 25 years, more or less, since 1990. The middle class is now about 20% of the developing world, if we count $10 and above as middle class or rich. In the same time period, people have moved out of extreme poverty and the number of strugglers in the developing world has also almost doubled. So where do they live? The point here, the, the size of the circles is um, related to the numbers of people across countries. And most strugglers live in the middle income countries, including of course in this part of the world, in uh, the countries that you know, I hear you all talking about the question of more aid for countries that are already middle income. And I suppose part of this picture says yeah, they probably need not only aid but other kinds of help uh, and will for s quite a long time. Development is a long haul game. Uh, you see in the lower income countries, the licks, there are not so many strugglers. Uh, that's the poorest countries in Africa and South Asia. Uh, they're there, but really the, it's still the fact that most people are below even $1.90 a day. So here's a picture that gives you a sense of, uh, it's the same thing. In 2030, Across these countries, if you combine the red and the orange, the poor and the strugglers, uh, it's the overwhelming majority of um, people in countries including uh, Pakistan, India. But I added Indonesia to this picture to emphasize that Indonesia is, a, is different from Ethiopia and Tanzania, but not as different as you might think if you only went to Jakarta or Bali, right? <laughs> so uh, this is a picture that does the same thing with uh, the middle class in green and the countries are ranked from left to right in order of per capita GDP. And so what you see, again, with, uh, well, Indonesia's not in this picture. I'm not sure why. It got a, oh, yes, it is. Okay. So you see how large the struggler group is compared to the middle class in green. Uh, and the same in Sri Lanka. I was actually surprised about Sri Lanka. Um, in China, sorry? No. I'm looking myself. China. Then you see the contrast with several countries in Latin America, Colombia and Brazil, and with Thailand, uh, an upper middle income country, with, uh, uh, you know, now up to 50% uh, as over $10 middle class. And maybe I'll, I'll come to this a little more later. That is interesting because it is in countries like Thailand and Brazil with a large middle class that you're having a lot of <coughs> some people I would think of as perhaps healthy political disruption as more people are more engaged and have the time to engage with the political systems. <laughs> um, you probably know Thailand better than I do and you'll think, well, what does that mean? Uh, maybe I should just invoke Brazil where there's huge corruption scandals going on now including with uh, Lula who's the former president likely to run again. Um, and some people say, oh, you know, sign of a problem. Uh, the middle class doesn't solve things. But another way of looking at it is when more people are middle class, there's larger civil society movements, more active politics, big increase in the number of NGOs, all of those things that we associate with the willingness to demand from government accountability. Um, so I'll come back to that in a few minutes. 
So what are the key characteristics of strugglers beyond this crude income classification? Um, so I'll go through that quickly. You know, first, they are mostly living in urban and peri-urban areas. Uh, in rural areas, at least in Africa and South Asia, you know, poverty, extreme poverty is more common. They have primary schooling. Um, this is a very complicated graph, no need to f try to figure it out. But what it's saying is that across <laughs> Latin America, where we could look at data that was able to be analyzed because it was micro household data, uh, and isolate four to ten dollars, and then look at how much education people in that group had. And it's basically primary education, sometimes completed primary education. And the bottom half of the graph shows, for those of you who know about these things, you know the standard errors around the mean. And there are people with secondary education several years in many countries in Latin America who are living at incomes below $10 a day per capita in their households. So it's not a simple story from that point of view at any one point in time. But what is fascinating is that if you look at Honduras, one of the poorest countries in Latin America in 1980, and you look at Chile, one of the richest countries in 2015, on average, people under $4 don't have yet full primary education. $4 to $10, strugglers, on average, have primary education. It's really interesting in terms of, you know, what is it in term, uh, in human, that links human capital, the ability to read at least a little bit and write, to productivity reflected in <coughs> average income is sort of oddly stable over time and across countries. So there's a, you can feel optimistic about that in the sense that if you could get more children through more schooling where they're actually learning something, uh, they will be more productive. This is a very indirect way of showing something that economists and others have argued <laughs> for many decades. So. Uh, on average primary education, relatively low human capital. Um, this picture is meant to sort of presage, it's easier to say, most strugglers are informal. They're, they're both informal sector workers and they work as informal workers, a combination of those two things. Again, this is from data uh, from Latin America and I labeled it there in the in-between sectors, between agriculture and formal sector jobs. That's what these crossing lines are basic, basically showing you for different countries. Uh, this is a <coughs> very interesting graph from a new study out of the Overseas Development Institute in the UK. And uh, the title of their study is Informality, the New Normal or something like that. And they're making two points. First, most people in developing countries uh, who are not middle class or rich work in the informal sectors. And they have and they will be for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So, you know, I think we all have a tendency to think of inequality even in the rich world as associated going all the way back to Marx, between workers who have a pay stub but a low wage, and the rich who have a pay stub or benefit also from capital income. But it's the pay stub workers who are the working class and uh, the fighters for you know, better lives. And that's at the roots of the liberal parties around the world. Um, and now, uh, worryingly, <laughs> sort of associated in mature democracies with the rise of populism and, and the right. It's a different world out there in the developing countries. <coughs> Pretty much most of, po of the populations in most countries don't have a pay stub. They live with vulnerability. They live with anxiety. That's the point here. I mean, this shows the share of employment, 
for non-agriculture workers from the poorest countries at the top to the richest countries at the bottom. So the message is, and this is something that's particularly the case for women, because this includes a lot of, lot of female-headed households, of course, are in, do informal kinds of work. And uh, we'll come later a little bit to the costs of that as well as the benefits. So this is Indonesia uh, in the middle here. You can read along. It's basically showing you the same thing, that the poor and strugglers in non-agricultural work in, in Indonesia, they make up 90% of uh, informal workers. So I wanted, so that's sort of education and work, you know, what's the characteristics of strugglers. Um, some of you might be familiar with this relatively famous elephant graph of Branko Milanovic. Um, and uh, I want to just talk about this a little bit in the context of trying to suggest another aspect of being a struggler, which in the first place is uh, most strugglers out there have succeeded. They've lifted themselves out of poverty. They're the ones who migrated from rural areas uh, to peri-urban and urban areas who had enough education, they had enough capital initially to at least move, and so on. They are the orange group. I've drawn it here, redrawn it a little bit <coughs> to, so it coincides with actual, <coughs> along the horizontal axis, uh, daily income per capita. So they're the back of the elephant that had captured a lot of the benefits of growth in the developing <coughs> world. And you know, behind this is the story of globalization. And if you're a development person, you're sort of a globalist. And it's important to recognize how good global economic globalization has been for fostering, um, for improving the lives of the poor and lifting people out of poverty, right? So behind that economic globalization is a, a view of development where I think we should all be globalists, which is a little different from globalization but we should embrace globalism. And this takes us back to the tumult in Washington and the call of uh, Senator Wong for a bipartisan <coughs> agreement because it reflects the idea that in this world we should all be global citizens in our own interests as well as reflecting our values. Anyway, the strugglers are, ha were big gainers from what happened between the 1988 and 2011, that's the data that Branko Milanovic put across, uh, used to, to draw this graph. On the far, then you see the middle class in the developing world in green have also gained, this is how much they captured of growth. So they haven't lost <coughs> out, uh, but in relative terms, a little bit less than strugglers. And of course, the rise of populism and so on, you know, the reason the graph became famous is over on the right, you have the losers in the rich world. U.S. middle class are the big losers right here, boom, compared to the richer 1% and 0.01% and so on. And now we know from new work of Piketty that many of you will know his name and the well-known book, Capital, that this phenomenon in India is just extraordinary. It's something like the point, top 0.01% uh, of, of the rich, of the population at the top end in India has captured something like the same amount of growth as the bottom 50% of the population. So this, is, this graph is illustrating something that's going on in the world in terms of the way we think about inequality and who's benefiting, who's gaining, and who's losing. Um, however, <coughs> A colleague of mine at the center <coughs> used data since 2011 to update the elephant, and he calls it the Loch Ness Monster. <laughs> and in this graph, on the far right, you go beyond the 99th percentile to, you know, point 0.1, uh, 
at the top and 0.01 and 0.001 and so on. Uh, based on more scrutiny by Piketty and others using countries like India that have tax data because the elephant graph is based solely on household survey data where there's considerable underreporting at the top of the distribution. And so it doesn't really capture the extent to which the rich have captured so many of the benefits. So when you redraw it and you take into account which parts of the population captured the most, uh, you see that the strugglers in the first, well, you can see them labeled two to $10 in this graph. They've still done well, but not as well. And this is interesting in the context of the growing concern about inequality within countries. And what I called, you know, expectations maybe aren't being met for continued growth among strugglers who were successful in moving out of poverty. And they are still living in an anxious world. 30 minutes? Great, okay, thanks. So let me go to a little bit about why strugglers matter, that it goes a little closer to not only the economics but the politics of what we're talking about. Uh, this is a picture, by the way, from rioting in Brazil in Sao Paulo, I think, or Rio de Janeiro, when bus fares were increased. And we did a little analysis at CGD of um, if at median income in the city of Rio, that increase in the bus fare would take a substantial portion, too substantial, out of uh, the pockets of people who take those two-hour bus rides, strugglers, in and out of the city. So they went to the streets, uh, they or the middle class. We don't really know because we didn't have a chance to survey people in the streets. <laughs> All right, so the middle class and the state, um, take a quick read, and I'll take a drink of water, of what Aristotle had to say. <coughs> So I guess the point of this slide and, and the message for me is that the middle class is a different phenomenon politically in that the middle class has the income to actually support government and government services through the tax system. And because if the middle class pays taxes, it has an instrument in principle to hold government accountable. So it's not as though the middle class solves all problems of bad governance, not at all. Um, the middle class can create problems, particularly if they're trying to compete with their view of the privileged insider elites who have all kinds of political rents and so on. But it may be that overall it helps as you have more people going into the middle class. So. One way to think about development is building a middle class society in which there's a group of people who can afford to pay taxes that allows for all the social services that helps create sound, sustained institutions and holds the political actors accountable. Now, there's a lot of talk about other benefits of the middle class, particularly, you know, creating more demand for consumption, taking reasonable risks, and so on. But that's the one that I think is the most interesting in terms of why it's different to be in a society where most people are strugglers than to be in a society where at least 50% or 45% of people are in the middle class. Now, the fact is that in your, the countries, um, the, the lower middle income countries, many of which are Indonesia and companies, Sri Lanka and so on, Papua New Guinea, the countries that I hear about when I'm uh, in this part of the world, they are, they have very small proportion of population in the middle class. It's only Thailand, as I said, Malaysia, of course, where there's a larger middle class. And one way to think about it is in terms of absolute tax revenues which are, it's amazing actually. This shows, you know, Ethiopia has $73 a year per person in tax revenue. The OECD countries have over $13,000 a year per person 
in tax revenue. Indonesia, about $400 a year in revenues per person, the Indonesian government. So it helps when your middle class gets larger, just on the simple measure of tax revenue. You have more people to tax. Um, and this, you know, for those of you who might be political scientists, talk of the median voter. The median voter in Brazil is a struggler, right? So that makes it hard. And in, Bra in Brazil, they have actually collect too many taxes per person, but we can talk about that. And even in Brazil, don't try to figure this out because I want to stop in a few minutes. Um, even in Brazil, strugglers lose out. They are net payers into the tax system, mostly because of indirect taxes, consumption, the VAT, trade taxes, and all of those things. Um, the rich do pay more, but not in any sense proportionately more because of the absence of property taxes in particular, I would argue and taxes on capital. In Indonesia, the median voter is poor. Again, it just gives you a feel for the difficulty of having the resources to become a good government when you are a struggler society. In India, and these are you know, density distributions of, the, of income, uh, the median it's $1.60 a day in PPP terms of consumption, but M India is still a society of the truly poor. It's amazing, actually. So let me go quickly to what to do and what to think. Um, the first thing I wanted to mention for those of you who think about these things, like at the Development Policy Institute, <laughs> is economic growth matters enormously. <clears throat> That's what brought us a world where most people are strugglers in the developing world rather than poor. Uh, and the macro fundamentals we know have been incredibly important uh, in this process. In Africa, from 2000 to 2015, average growth per capita per year was uh, 5%, the highest in the world for a reg sub-Saharan region, the highest in the world for any region. And it was all based on just getting, you know, dealing appropriately with macro management. So I wanted to say that. But also, obviously, from so much of what I've said, it's inclusive growth that matters. And for that, you need an active, effective state. So what to do if you're a development thinker, a development advocate, for maybe the thinkers, you know, more focus on how to improve productivity in the informal sector itself. It, the answer is not manufacturing. So the old story of structural change and growth isn't going to work. We, have, we will have in high levels of informality for another 10 to 15 years, straight through 2030, the year of the Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, more focus on social insurance, not just redistribution, social cash transfers for the extreme poor, but setting up systems of social insurance from which most strugglers in most countries do not benefit, pensions, health insurance, and so on. The politics of tax policy that I've alluded to a little bit, design of automatic stabilizers. Be careful when the IMF says you have to reduce food s fuel subsidies. They're right in the medium term, but in the short run, there will be many people in the struggler group who absolutely cannot afford to buy t kerosene if you increase the price by 50%. So that uh, there's a transition. And all the issues of universal basic income and distribution of natural resource rents, countries like PNG, some new thinking about how to make transfer programs work within countries as well as across countries. In the, in the age of robots, you know, the obsession with problems of automation, true, but you know, that is not necessarily the best way to think about the future of work in the developing world. Uh, development thinkers have to sort of take, think about a new way to think about it. And then finally, what to do, the role of outsiders. You know, I thought 
much of what the shadow minister said was really great and so wonderfully e evidence-based. So I'm not adding anything new here, except to focus on beyond aid, constructing a just global system. Trade, technology, the things that I mentioned CGD worries about, support for the multilateral institutions and globalism, support for NGOs and civil society and think tanks in the developing world. Maybe because I'm a think tank person, I can't believe how little support there is for independent thinking within countries. Uh, that people who can become uh, you know, watchdogs for their own governments. And then finally, of course, the problem of collective action. I didn't put it down here in a global system. You know, what to do about climate change, what to do about uh, pandemic disease risk, what to do about the lack of research into agriculture uh, for countries that still have very low agricultural productivity, on and on, the SDGs and the Paris Accord. Let me end on a high note. Thank you very much. <laughs> Let me add, this should be real, really, remember Mohammed Bouazizi's sister. Um, he wanted her to go to university and we don't know if she made it. I worry that she didn't, but I hope she did because women's empowerment is so key. Thank you, Nancy, that's fantastic. And I think there is, you can see in your presentation that the culture that you brought to CGD and kind of continues through, which is evidence-based. I love as a policy maker, there's a very short list of what we get to do to fix it. I'm sure that things are a little tricky. Um, but that actually may be what we can explore now. So I think we've got about 15 minutes, Stephen, 15 or 20 for questions and answers. I think we only have one microphone, so that we may kind of need to go one by one unless people are sitting right beside each other. So let me encourage you, if the person beside you is asking a question, then you should do one as well. Okay, who's going to go first? We have one over here, thanks. And then we'll come up here next. Any in this group, any others? <laughs> uh, my question is about how well do you think um, organisations based in development are able to account for um, idea, ideas like that the injustice occurs not at the material level, first of all, so not associating injustice, first of all, on the material level with poverty, but at the ideational level, like, um, yeah, the um, ideas of criticism of coloniality, modernity, rationality, that it's infantil the infantilization of um, indigenous economies kind of thing, and that, yeah, Right. Injustice I think at I the understand the question. Because <laughs> first, right. You know, it's interesting that you ask that question because uh, because I worked for many years on Latin America. Uh, what I learned is that, and this is true of India as well, and maybe of other societies, but you know, like reflecting my own experience, ideas do matter a lot. Um, sometimes too much debate that starts with ideas. It's not the Asian way. I don't know about Australia and I don't know about PNG, but certainly in East Asia, I think the success of East Asia had to do with pragmatism, you know, and not le débat, kind of. <laughs> so, uh, you know, I, d I think it's easy to but many people who study Africa say it's all about colonialism. But why, what are, you know, the question is why has it gone on too long that there is still whatever burdens having been colonies imposed still matters. So on the one hand, yes, history matters. On the other hand, it's time to f figure out and think intelligently about how these things from the past, in the case of indigenous people here, how they ca are sustained and then what to do about it. Effective, active state. 
Thank you so much. That was fabulous. Um, I'm just wondering if you have much to do with the WHO High uh, Level Commission on Health, Employment and Economic Growth. And I think that commission looked at quite a new interesting way. I think if we recognise healthy communities are obviously a benefit for any society, but the influence of this CHI commission was looking at the economic growth of actually putting more resources into health so that actually the whole society can actually support the health systems from the farmer who produces the food to the, the local unemployed youth who can maybe help with maintenance to a whole variety of health professionals. And I think it's an angle we haven't maybe looked at and it certainly fits, <coughs> seems to fit with your model. Um, yeah, I don't know the report. I bet one of, one of my colleagues at the center, we have a lot of really wonderful work on health issues. Uh, does know about that WHO report. Let me just say that your question, you know, reminds me to say that we do know now from research that living with anxiety and stress is, is really bad news for people. I mean, there are a lot of good studies uh, in the U.S. of African-American children who live under a lot of stress sometimes violence at home, all of these things, discrimination itself, and that it affects their health and it affects their long-run productivity as individuals, their ability to support themselves. So I think there's, it's very interesting about strugglers, that they are struggling. You know, they also are striving, they have aspirations, but that creates a kind of stress. And it's not that different, I think, for many people in the developing world in that income group than it is for the uh, lower middle class in countries like the U.S. where the inequality problem is creating, you know, the fact that they're not benefiting and that the state and the system appears to them to be rigged and it is probably in many ways, right? So these. I think it's a great idea for that kind of a report that brings together work, productivity, stress, mental health, uh, that we're paying a very high price, even in the rich world, for the costs we impose on people associated with vulnerability and uncertainty. Um, my name's Andrew Campbell from ACR. Thank you, Nancy, for a very fascinating data-rich presentation. Much of your data appeared to focus on people in the non-agricultural economy. Many of the countries in which we work, Pakistan for example, 80% of the population still work in agriculture. And the data is very clear that um, improving agricultural productivity disproportionately benefits the poorest of the poor, but also um, is one of the most uh, cost-effective ways of lifting people out of poverty. So. <coughs> How does the agricultural economy relate to your strugglers' narrative? Mm -hmm, very good. Well, I think y you're right. I did some work many years ago on the success of East Asia, you know, Korea, uh, Taiwan, Malaysia, Thailand. And compared to Latin America, agriculture was not taxed. In Latin America and in many other developing regions for many years, agriculture was taxed in the form of uh, overvalued exchange rates, which were good for the poor, I mean the urban poor, and the urban workers, right. So, and now I'm on the board of IFPRI, and I've learned a lot more about, that's more up to date on what's going on. So I appreciate your question. I'm not the best person to answer it, but what, what I think is at the heart of what you're saying is about raising <coughs> agricultural productivity. And you know, agricultural productivity in Africa sort of is four times lower than in China. So big investments are needed, including in R&D, in figuring out ways, but also in the public good of extension and so on. But the future, I think, is, this is, I alluded to this when I said it's not going to be the structural shift from agriculture to manufacturing that <coughs> is so good in, in Korea and other East Asian economies. It has to be in these areas of work, including agriculture. 
and you know, I think agro industry and food systems. How are food systems working? The benefits of um, you know, data, data science and data analytics for improving food systems uh, are huge. I, so I don't know if I can add anything to your question except I can't answer it except to say yes, absolutely. But it may not be simply raise productivity of these farmers. It may be, again, from the top down, how to connect them better to markets, obviously. In Africa, it's a complete disaster. <coughs> and the answer to con in Africa may not be ag extension and working on ag productivity with farmers. It may be building roads, you know, so that they have access to peri-urban markets. So long answer that rambled without. <laughs> Good question. And you're right. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, Duncan McIntosh from APNIC, the Internet Registry for the Asia Pacific. I wanted to ask about connectivity and the impact or the potential for impact on the strugglers that connectivity can provide. And do you feel there's enough research in that whole area of the benefits or possible benefits of connectivity? Yes, well, I mean, you're referring to sort of mobile money maybe, or computers or laptops or tablets and the internet connection. No question, it's huge, right, for most people in developing countries. After all, it's connectivity in the rich world, including roads and bridges, uh, that has made us rich. You know, what's the big difference in many ways it's also, it's not just computers, it's electricity. I would put a huge premium on bringing power to, so we could have a little bit more mechanization in agriculture, a little bit more, you know, like in Cambodia where there's more activity with more power connectivity, not just the sort of internet connectivity, but power, they're, they're getting rich doing milling, you know, in, in rural areas. So, but I do think we should think of the internet as a public infrastructure. And in places where it's not happening through private investment, uh, I think there are huge social returns to uh, public investment in connectivity in, in the sense that you're discussing it. Um, so we can't wait necessarily in every country for the telecommunications firms. I mean, it worked in Kenya with mobile money but the mystery still, I think, that people don't, haven't given me an answer is why is it taking so much longer in other places? And it has to do with who had the original monopoly in the telecoms area and, you know, there was one big telecom provider so they, could, they had a private return to investing in the places where, blah, 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 long story. Those of you, many of you may know more about this than I do, but it had to do with the central bank hands off back to good policy at the top. So, you know, if development is about um, doing the right thing at the sort of macro and meta level uh, and the regulatory areas as well as addressing the needs of people on the ground. So connectivity is a great subject in that way, especially if it's thought of in broader terms, not just the internet, but we all need more connections uh, and certainly strugglers do to be able to be more productive and thus richer. <laughs> we have a question right up at the top of the line. Um, so while, while the microphone's making its way, can I extend that question, take the chair of, or the prerogative of the chair, just to extend that technology question a little bit um, and, and ask you about uh, impact of uh, robots or AI or machinery. We talked a bit about manufacturing, I think a bit of a time, you, you hinted, I think, in your presentation about a 10 or 15 or 20 year window that's coming up. So there's been a lot of discussion around the impact of um, uh, robots and te technology on manufacturing and what that means for a range of countries as it's squarely in the middle of, of your data. So maybe you want to say something about that. Yes, so I, you know, it's really, I, I, I go between thinking, oh, absolutely, this is really an issue that has to be addressed. 
and thinking, the secret for structural change and long-term development is with automation, but not via manufacturing. I think we have to get past that. Uh, we know, uh, Danny Roderick refers to the phenomenon of premature deindustrialization. And what he's saying is, you know, just to give you something <coughs> to hang on to, at its maximum in Korea, uh, manufacturing took up 40% of the labor force. <coughs> manufacturing has already peaked in India and is now declining. It peaked with 8% of the labor force in manufacturing. So manufacturing is good in that it, you know, leads to higher output per worker. But it, if you're concerned about, if we're all concerned about robots and AI and the effect on jobs, I just think we got to get over this manufacturing thing. Um, Ethiopia is trying with Chinese, a lot of Chinese technical assistants to become a manufacturing powerhouse. But I have colleagues at the center who've done studies. You know, the cost of labor is too high in Africa. They are not going to be able to compete with Bangladesh. And why is the cost of labor too high? Because agricultural productivity is low. And so the real costs of living and eating in urban. So this, I think your question captures a lot along with this emphasis that I was trying to put on informality about how to rethink what to do if you're in development space. Um, that it may be, you know, that we need to rejigger our approach a little bit. Uh, it, I think in the rich world, there's time. I, I'm not, you know, I'm a little bit of the optimist about that. It's all going to work out. <laughs> you know, my daughter, who's a doctor, will not be r sort of interneted out of diagnosis work by machine learning. There will still be a need, but it'll still be different. I don't think we can foresee now what jobs will really be like, but I'm pretty confident in the rich world it will be such a long, slow adjustment. In the developing world, it's more worrying. It's really more worrying and too much talk of the demographic dividend without attention to the def demographic dividend is only a dividend in a good policy environment where you have an active, effective state doing some reasonable things. Thank you very much. And Elisa Prizzon from the Overseas Development Institute. Nice to thank you very much for your inspiring uh, keynote speech. And somehow to elaborate on the role of outsiders, uh, it would be great to hear your thoughts about uh, the role of multilateral development banks. I mean, you highlighted very clearly that most stragglers will leave, uh, leave and will leave uh, middle income countries. And we know that some shareholders in MDBs uh, would <coughs> like their management to change programs in multilateral development banks or even stop programs in multilateral development banks. So in this particular agenda, what should uh, MDBs do differently? Thank you. Yes, well, I'm a great believer. I think you're alluding to the discussion about whether uh, the World Bank and maybe the Asian Development Bank should do less in the middle income countries, particularly the upper middle income countries. And remember Tunisia and Mohamed Bouazizi in that context. Tunisia became an upper middle income country briefly and then has fallen back <coughs> given its difficulties in recent years. It is still needing support. It may not be that we should be doing grants, you know, in upper middle income countries, but there is huge need for continued support through loans and guarantees and public-private partnerships and catalyzing investment. Uh, I've become a little bit more of a believer in, yeah, the multilateral banks have to be more bold in working on finding ways to cover the political and regulatory risks to investors associated with moving into, you know, investing in infrastructure and so on. And there's 
no question that infrastructure needs, including public infrastructure, consider mass transit, you know, in Mumbai or even in Bangkok. You know, we've all suffered, or many of you will have suffered with the traffic in Bangkok. So the middle, the multilateral banks are really quite good about doing and monitoring major loans to do major investments. I think at the same time, I'm a believer in charging more countries that are a little bit richer so that the subsidy they get from multilateral loans is uh, a little smaller than the subsidy. You know, it shouldn't be the same for Ghana as it is for Thailand. I don't know if Thailand even borrows, but um, <coughs> for what's another country, Vietnam even. Um, so that's, that's my thought on, uh, I think this is coming from the US mostly, I don't know, maybe not from Australia, <laughs> from the Trump administration. Thanks, Nancy Sakalakmimana from DFAT. Um, I think the Mohamed Bouazizi story is emblematic not only because of the because of the economic vulnerability and precariousness, but also it's very illustrative of the predations of state actors, of the humiliations of the individual in the face of petty authority. Um, and in many ways, this is as much a a problem of political management for the countries, the lower and upper middle income countries that you're talking about. Um, how much awareness do you think there is among developing country leaders of this demographic and of the kind of pressing nature of some of the policy prescriptions that you uh, were suggesting earlier? That's a really good question. It, it, and I love the way you put it, you expressed some of the issues better, you know, in relation to the question about ideas, humiliation, and so on. And I don't know the answer <laughs> to the question for developing countries of whether they're focused in quite this way um, at the political level. But I suppose part of my message is they ought to be, but it's not easy <coughs> because the the whole point about the difference between middle class and strugglers is strugglers don't have the time, right? Or the sort of, um, they're not paying taxes, they don't have the political agency uh, to make their demands. They don't have the time to figure out what their demands are. So it's a good point. You know, um, I'd, I'd hope that development advocates and development thinkers who work in developing countries would start thinking about it that way, that you're poor, you're, you have these new poor, and we recognize it's a tough situation, you know, and if you don't start making your tax systems, that would be one message for me, more progressive, by developing systems to tax property and to tax high incomes. Uh, you, you know, you can increase consumption taxes only so much before you start uh, immiserating the strugglers, pushing them back below the poverty line. So, good point, but I don't know. The one thing I want to say, because on the question on the multilateral banks about the role of outsiders is, these changes in the world, the geopolitical shifts, the rise of China and countries like Brazil and Turkey, I think, you know, it isn't, I'm not always sure it's uh, internalized sufficiently, including in the banks, that until those governments take ownership of what they need to do, no amount of money and harassing. <coughs> and so I think in the aid community, I'm a big believer in, um, results-based, outcome-based, ex post, paying grant money ex post when something, when progress has been shown by some measures. Not coming with a blueprint, you know, now this is what you have to do in secondary education, build the schools and train the teachers. No, no, no. It's your job in the country. It's your job. And 
So in Asia, many countries have succeeded on their own, like Indonesia in many areas. So more recognition than until the responsibilities with those governments and for producing results, even though they're having to do, have resources because there so many people are poor and their tax revenue is not very high given the needs. That's sort of the role of outsiders to me is to be inspiring innovation and new ways of thinking and inter experiments. This is the way things worked out in the Western democracies, you know, incremental gains, innovation, and so on. We're out of time. Okay, Mary has had a hand up for a while, so I'm just going to ask a short question <laughs> and a short really answer. Really quick. Um, uh, Mary Moran uh, from Policy Where Cures. Are you? Sorry. Ah, oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Uh, thank you. You uh, you mentioned a lot that the real things that have brought people out of poverty are not to do with aid programs. They're things like um, trade um, threats to it. Would be things like not only with no, aid not programs. No, not only. Not only. <laughs> but I'm saying the, the big things have been uh, um, migration, trade agreements, those kinds of things. So, and aid programs often tend to have a bilateral or regional focus, trying to deal with the impacts of those changes. So, for instance, um, what made it impossible, or very difficult for us to treat HIV patients was the World Trade Organization set the rules that govern uh, the prices of AIDS drugs. So, what I'm wondering, do you think it would be helpful for aid programs to shift their weight from bilateral regional focus, which they can tend to have, and really focus more heavily on influencing those other areas. So the trade agreements, the environment agreements, the stuff that's happening with AI, they're the things that are going to, as you've said, determine who stays in or rises from poverty. Do you think aid programs should be rebalanced a bit? Um, I think both have to be on the agenda. You know, aid, the way we think of it in a conventional sense, and work in development policy, maybe not inside the government, inside the Crawford's Development Policy Institute and ODI and CG, CGD, and civil society on, you know, it got worked out eventually, the problem with WTO rules and the pricing of HIV drugs. It took too long, lives were lost, but thanks to a huge civil society movement and the Clinton Foundation on pricing and lobbying and so on. So I'm, I think, I suppose I would say I would like more aid to go, as I said, to groups in developing countries of NGOs, civil society, think tanks, who can carry that message right, within their own countries and to the rest of the world. And there has been a huge increase in the number of NGOs, I said this yesterday to somebody in Asia and Africa, that have, uh, are internationally affiliated, you know, have signed up with the UN as international NGOs. And I think that's a result in many countries of the middle class being more active. So I don't think it's an either or. Um, I do think a little bit in the premise of your question was maybe not so much the aid money in the aid community, but the larger development community, including advocates, NGOs, students, think tanks, more focus on the benefits, how to capture the benefits of migration, more focus on what to do about uh, distortions in trade rules or in the way they're implemented, right? more focus on technology transfer and who's going to pay for licensing certain new technologies uh, for countries in Africa. That's maybe something for the multilateral institutions to think through more. So more focus on the global system, which is what, some of what you're implying. So you give me heart that, you know, this was <laughs> something we've been trying to do at the Center for Global Development is, is focused not only on better aid, but on better policy in the broader sense in these other areas. Thanks, Nancy. Well, uh, apologies to Stephen for running slightly over time, but I think it's a rare privilege to have someone like Nancy. So please have
Uh, thank you, Blair. And of course, Nancy, it's a real privilege to have Nancy Birdsell here. If you want to hear more from her, she's speaking again. Uh, <laughs> right? <laughs> Don't forget. Uh, tomorrow at 11 o'clock, panel 4B, the future of multilateral development banking with Nancy Birdsell. Uh, we now, and I also want to say we, it is the Australasian Aid Conference, but it is about aid and international development. So all those broader issues, we hope to give a, a lot of discussion. Uh, we're now going to break for morning tea. After morning tea, there are parallel sessions. Parallel sessions are nearly all submitted. So this is very much a bottom-up conference, uh, but we'll resume in, in, back here at uh, 1.30. The morning tea is brought to us by the Australian Ca Centre for International Agricultural Research. So thank you, Andrew and ACR. <laughs>